Um, cool. So it is now half past. So I wanted to kick this off. We have a lot of things to talk about. So for our audience joining us, thank you very much. We're super excited you're here. Let me start by telling you what this event is not about. So this is not about doom and gloom. We're not going to talk about NASDAQ falling and Amazon missing their sales forecast and VC funding drying up because you can open any front page and read about that. What this event is about is optimism. It's about us as sales leaders making the best that we can out of this situation. And right now, more than ever, our companies depend on us to do our best with the customers at the front line. They want us to retain the customers we have find new avenues of growth, uh, maintain the morale of the team and of the company. And this is, this is what this event is about. So my hope for today is that everyone can take away one or two things that they can implement in their business uh, tomorrow or today if you're on the West Coast and you still have half a day left. No, no time to waste. <laughs> so we have two very exciting guests today who are very experienced sales leaders, but also know the world from the other side, the investing side. Um, and I will leave it up to them to introduce yourself, starting with Mecca, so we don't talk over each other. <laughs> Hey everyone, nice uh, nice to, to kind of see you virtually. My name is Mecca Sonye. I'm a partner at First Round Capital. Uh, we are the institutional seed VC, been around for about 15 years and the early money behind Uber, Square, Roblox, Looker, Notion, Flexport, and a whole bunch of other names. Um, prior to joining First Round, I actually, uh, I was in your shoes. I was holding a bag. So I um, was uh, at Stripe for five years, uh, ended up leading the SMB sales organization. And then um, I led revenue at Mixpanel before jumping over to the dark side. Um, but I had a quarterly ARR number seven quarters ago. So I remember what end of quarter is like. Awesome. Um, then Mike, over to you. Mike, yep. can we... We see you a little bit frozen. Okay, while um, while Mike is reconnecting, <laughs> let me give you a bit of a roadmap for today. So there are four broad topics we want to discuss. Um, one is managing your team. We got a lot of questions uh, from all of you on LinkedIn about the best ways to manage your team, upscale, up level, uh, you know, should you be hiring, who you should be hiring. So we'll start by talking about team. Then we'll talk about managing our customers. Um, how do we retain them? How do we turn conversations uh, into a more positive light? Uh, and then after customers, we'll talk a bit about pipeline. How do you manage your pipeline and where to still get leads? And we'll close on a very important topic, which is the relationship between the head of sales uh, and the CEO and the board of the company, which I believe a lot of you guys uh, will, will be part of in the coming months. And now Mike is back. So would you like to introduce yourself, please? Would love to. Uh, thanks for having me, Daria. Yeah. Hey, everyone. I'm Mike Marg. I am a partner at Craft Ventures. Um, I'm a SaaS focused investor. I think Craft does a lot of SaaS investing and a lot of marketplace investing. And um, I'm a former seller sales leader. I sold at Dropbox, Slack, and uh, led teams at Clearbit. So um, definitely approach my investing job like a seller and um, really look for. SaaS investments that I'd be excited to sell myself. So great to meet you all. Thanks for having me, Daria. Amazing. Um, great. So without further ado, let's kick it off. Um, what? How do you think has the role of a sales leader? And also, by the way, caveat, we say as sales leaders, I know there are also AEs in the audience. It's awesome that you guys are there. This is the best way to get yourself promoted and to get ahead is to start thinking about those strategic topics. So at, at, I will keep reminding Mecca and Mike that when we talk about sales leaders, also please drop some, some hints for the AEs in the audience, something that they can implement into their own journeys. So um, how has the role of a sales leader or an AE changed in this, in this down market? I can I can jump in. Um, I think all of us who've been in this seat sort of understand the uh, the the guts and the glory and the pressure that comes with sort of ha meeting your quarterly or monthly or annual target number. And I would say in this environment, um, 
that pressure is amped up. I'd say for the most part, um, you know, we're seeing a bit of, of portfolio companies kind of going in, in two directions. There's one type of portfolio company that's blaming, blaming the macro right now and saying, oh, we missed our number and uh, it's, it's a macro environment. And honestly, I push back a little bit and say that's bullshit. Like you were, we're dealing with early stage companies. Like if you really are worried about the macro impacting your revenue growth and unable to go from 5 million to 10 million, what does that say about, you know, the company as it gets bigger? And so I think the pressure is just higher. Um, you know, companies are, I, we talked about this not being a doom and gloom, but I would say that like companies are starting to lay people off and it is really important to make sure that you are hitting your number. And if you're not hitting your number, that there's a pretty good plan of action of why things are going to be different uh, in next quarter. And so I'd say, unfortunately, the, the pressure is amped up a little bit, but I also think that um, this is a great time to be in sales. Um, I think that, if you really are passionate about the product that you're selling, like nothing's changed. The value proposition is still there. And so you see a lot of people who try to change their behavior in an environment like this. And I actually just think that it becomes more and more important to, to value sell, to make sure that you're communicating clearly with your customers on sort of what you can do to, to help them improve. And so um, I, I, uh, I think it's a fun time to be in sales. Mike, do you see that the same way or something else you're seeing in the market? I don't think the role changes that much. I think the role is always blocking and tackling, create pipeline, close the pipeline. It's, it's pretty simple in that regard. I think what changes is you'll have more obstacles in your quest to do both things. People may not respond to your outbound as readily. They may not uh, show up to a call as reliably. They may not purchase as reliably. So I think the role changes because you have to become more of a problem solver and you have to be more paranoid and you have to be more unwilling to rely on natural momentum to get a deal done. I think you have to kind of assume something's going to go off the rails um, and just have tactics to de-risk and deal with those inevitable obstacles. So I think that that's where the macro stuff comes in is just like more opportunity for a deal to go wrong. But I think the fundamental mm -hmm. job stays pretty similar. Maybe your team doesn't grow headcount as fast. Maybe some things around you kind of mm. change, but I think the core job is very, very similar. Yeah, it's yeah. crazy. Yeah, sorry, Mick, I interrupted you. <laughs> no, no, I was going to say on, on, yeah. on the positive side, one of the things that I think actually happens is things get clarified. And so I would always tell my team, yeses are great, no's are good, and then maybes will kill you. And I think in this environment, people are just really laser focused on a, a list of fewer initiatives. So rather just than being in all of these conversations where mm -hmm. everything is up and to the right, everyone's happy to take a call, everyone's responding to your outbound messaging, and then you get a lot of these deals that just get stuck in the middle of the pipeline. Mm -hmm. I think what I'm seeing a lot of is that like actually close rates, once you look at actually having an opportunity, close rates are increasing because people are more focused on a smaller set of initiatives that actually move the needle, which means you're wasting less time with unqualified people. Mm, yeah, yeah, that's a great point. I, to your point, Mike, we, we've just came from SaaS talk and someone gave me this awesome like talking line where like saying salespeople used to be order takers in the last two years, right? Where all you do is like collect, collect the money, right? And now you need to be creating demand in a way um, rather than just, you know, <laughs> walking with the head and, and getting the money in. Um, so the first, the first block of what we're going to talk about um, is the team, managing your team. Um, how, what are the best practices in terms of managing performance? I know it's a hard question. Um, that's why our audience is here. Let, let's answer the hard question for them. I think there's inputs and outputs, and I think good sales managers are paying attention to both. If you follow just the outputs, you're at risk of attributing success to luck or things that aren't repeatable. If you only measure the inputs without the outputs, I think you're at risk of just rewarding activity essentially and not really mm. caring how good the activity is or, or the quality of the work. So I think part of it is making sure activity is high. Um, Pete Kazanji always talks about this, but like there's just no substitute for activity and there's no substitute for hard work and grinding and like talking to a lot of accounts. And then layer on top of that, high quality activities and high quality conversations and 
sales efforts that are informed by a deep product knowledge and deep hunger to push conversations forward and make them close or, you know, not close on time. Um, so that's kind of how I see it is if you measure the activity and you measure the quality of the activity, that's most of what being a good sales manager is to me. And does that change in the down market in any way? No, it really doesn't. I think maybe there's a third layer on top of the inputs, which is like, Hey, why are you spending time talking to a segment that seems to be like, now they have no budget, you know? So there are these, like, are you adjusting your strategy in an intelligent way due to the macro? But as long as that's part of your feedback loop, I think that it, it's always going to be a job of how hard are you grinding and how skilled are you? And those two things produce mm -hmm. with, with enough time, produce kind of a sense of how good you are at selling. Mecca, what about you? How did you manage your, your sales teams in the past? Yeah, I mean, I think an early manager once told me that if you show up at performance review time and there's a surprise, then you failed as a manager. And so that's always been my thought with any rep, whether it's SMB, whether it's enterprise, is like nothing should come as a surprise. And I think the key mm -hmm. to making nothing come as a surprise is, you know, similar to what Mike said of inputs and outputs, I always think about it as leading indicators and lagging indicators. And there's the lagging indicator, which is oftentimes what you get paid on. And many people are very, very focused on the lagging one, and they should be. But I think the other thing is, as a sales leader, is it's important for you to pull forward your rep's attention to top of funnel all of the leading indicators and help it help mm. them say, okay, are you going to meet your number? If not, why not? How big is that gap in some of these leading indicators and what do you need to do in order to course correct? And so I'm always just incredibly focused on those leading and lagging indicators. And then I think the further up market you go where people are more uh, sort of like, you know, whale hunting and thinking about one opportunity, I'm trying to spend time on the phone on deals with those reps and making sure that whatever's in the pipeline, whatever stage is actually accurate um, and trying mm -hmm. to help troubleshoot and just get things across the finish line. And just to throw like a hard question at you, um, there are a lot of companies out there that overhired last year. <laughs> How do you know if your team is right sized for the job? <laughs> well, I mean, I would say that's not an AE's job. I think that's a leader's yeah. job. And for me, I always have, um, uh, uh, a sort of like sales operations formula. I know exactly how much top of funnel I need. I know exactly what my conversion rates are. I know exactly how many people I need. I know how big the gap is that needs to be filled via outbound. I know how much money is going to come in in quarter and close that, that any, you know, VP of sales or any sales manager, like this, this funnels down. So as a VP of sales, obviously you're thinking about it across your entire business, but as a sales manager, you should have that same formula in your head for your team of, mm. you know, seven reps and, and two SDRs, or for somebody who owns a segment or a territory, you've got to understand the same thing. And ideally you've built that formula such that there's some cushion in there or such that, you know, what leverage mm. you might be able to close, um, to close any gap. What about you, Mike? I just think if your team is missing wildly across the board, you probably have too many mouths to feed. And mm. if your team is doing pretty well and people are hitting and org wide attainment is, is pretty close to hundred percent, I feel like you could probably continue to grow and at least, mm. you know, keep the team the same size. I, I just think it's those indicators of like how well are we tracking towards our goals are pretty reliable in terms of are we over or understaffed. Mm, yeah, makes sense. So a lot of we had a question from the audience uh, from Matt Milligan in the UK. Um, the question is how to level up BC players to get more out of the existing team. Oh, I'm, I'm probably going to drop a hot take, which is if the C player hasn't leveled up already, it's too late. I, I personally, I think that um, you obviously give people time to ramp as a leader, as a manager, you obviously try to improve people's performance, but far too many people get stuck spending all of their time trying to make a C player, a B player versus keeping their players happy. Um, or if you think about how precious every single individual lead is, and you think about that lead sitting with the C player, you're doing everyone a disservice. So for me, it's all about figuring out like, what is the right ramp? What are the activities that people need to do to ramp? What are the couple of things we can actually correct? But if someone doesn't get on board quickly, I, I'm, I'm of the mind that you cut bait quickly and bring somebody else in who's going to be an A player. I've got no time for B and C players in my organization. 
I what actually you, had Mike? a similar reaction to the question, which was like, it's really hard to change someone's nature in a startup environment. Startups are like, hey, we got a mission. It's time sensitive. Let's like pull together the best people in the world at solving this and let's go. And you kind of don't have the time to change someone's fabric of what makes them who they are. And I think that's when I hear C or B or A player, it's so much, it, it's like how, how good is your internal software at like learning how, how much do you mm. care? How, how good is your effort? That to me is really hard to change. So I, w without breaking it down, getting too scientific, I kind of think it goes into change your screening process and how you interview and how, how tough you are at handing out jobs. But it's by the time you've kind of decided who's in and who's out, it's kind of too late. You, you So basically you want to apply that to your screening and, mm. and be less focused on changing who people are. Um, maybe though, if you kind of do your analysis, what makes them a C player? Oh, it's some sort of like, they don't understand the product enough, then maybe assign coaching towards those like low hanging fruit areas. But I think if they're not low hanging fruit, if they're more fundamental, very hard in the time you have allotted to change it in like a three or six month period. The other, I'll, I'll double down and say one other thing yeah. is I think I've seen people improve. Um, and I think the biggest question is if you say that you have a C player on your hand and they're three months into the job, I would quickly ask, why do you think your performance is where it is? And what's your plan to mm. turn it around? And if someone isn't one, self-aware that they're not meeting <laughs> expectations, and then two, have already created an action plan and said, these are the things I'm going to do. These are the things that the organization might be able to do to support me. Like, without those answers, I feel really good about saying, like, this person is not the right person for this job and we should move on. I've seen mm. people who, you know, sort of ramp slower and start as a D player and then move to C and move to B and ultimately actually move to A, a players. But all of those people recognized where their gaps were and were working on improving those capabilities and actively involving, whether it was a peer rep who they looked up to or manager or somebody else, they were thinking about, I know I need to do better at this. And, and if you don't have someone who has that self-awareness, I think it's even easier to kind of make the call that they're never going to get there. And taking kind of Matt's question a bit further, like let's say you have A minus players or you have A players who want to become A star players. If you, is, is now the time to do a big kind of coaching project? What, what would you do? Like, would you hire an external firm? Would you double down on, as a sales leader on coaching your reps? Um, or even as an AE, if I want to get better to make sure I come out of the stronger, what, what are the right steps for me to take? I've always gotten a lot out of sales training. Um, shout out to Sandler. Shout out to Winning by Design. Shout out to John Barrows. Shout like there's kind of the, the sales trainers that you see if you're in these orgs long enough. And I think they do a great job. And what they tend to do is crystallize like something fuzzy in your head with a system. Here's a repeatable system to do this thing, whether it's write a good email or lead a good cold call or lead a good sales meeting. So I do think that the, like the, not just those three, but people like that, those are great investments to make. And then I think you also want to bolster that with some sort of a plan to continuously coach and reinforce whatever system you're adopting. Otherwise you spend all this money on a sales trainer and there's a spike and then you don't reinforce it. And those lessons go away really quickly. But then Daria, to tie back to your question, the A players will usually be the ones who like grab onto that and practice it in their spare time. And like, create materials around reinforcing those things so that it sticks. Um, so I, I think it's a mixture of invest in those resources, but also invest in supporting those lessons longer term. Mm. Mecca, what's your view? Yeah, I mean, I think Mike hit it on the head. I think one, sales training is always important. It's not more important or less important depending on the mm. macro environment. You've got to understand what your sales work stand for. You have to understand what your your playbook and process is going to be. And you know, I, I think of this a lot like, you go to gym on, on New Year's Day or the first day after the holidays and it's packed. And then you go two weeks later and no one's there. 
And that's what often happens with sales training. It's like you come in, you do this thing and it's top of mind and then it goes away. And you've got to just figure out ways to continue to build reminders in um, to make sure that people are still keeping that, keeping that top of mind. Again, I think the A players oftentimes like, are the person who's asking a lot of questions and want to put it into practice. And so uh, I, I think it's got to come somewhat bottoms up of, of individual desire from reps. And then some of it's got to come top down of making sure that you're building the systems and processes that are reminding people about what you taught. And, and I think mm-hmm. there's no, you know, it's, it's so easy for people to get obsessed with hiring like the 10 X AE, the best AE and to get a really great, you know, CRO. But I think, a lot of the hard work is done in the middle management is done where managers and reps and it's listening to calls and giving feedback on those calls or doing ride alongs and figuring out how you can be 1% better in every single call. And so, you know, I'm pushing the, the frontline managers as much as possible to spend more time on the phone, spend more time in client facing meetings. And, you know, I think the other thing that I'll say is that, you know, process and skills training is important, but what I've always found is like, if I can maximize one thing, it's a rep's knowledge of the product and the customer that they're serving. So that as they're dealing mm-hmm. with objections, because they've got that intimate knowledge, they can just deal with it so much better. And they come and they lead with a lot more empathy. Um, and you can just see the difference when someone has a conversation with someone who really knows the market and other customers and the product and somebody else who's sort of reading from a script or reading from a battle card and just doesn't have that inherent sense. Yeah. The thing I'd add is training. There's always like, here, here's the Sandler way of doing things or whatever system you're buying into. Here's the way that we do things. That's the same for every single company, right? That's why it's a system. That's why it works is it's always applicable, but there's a really important layer of here's what makes our org tick. Here's what makes our buyer personas tick. Here's institutional knowledge that we need. That's another thing that sales leadership really needs to focus on facilitating because that institutional knowledge is golden. And the faster you can share those learnings, the better off your org will be. We uh, just had a question from Justin, who is actually a Sandler lead here in uh, London. Thanks for tuning in, Justin. Great to see you. The question is, um, finding great salespeople today is harder than ever. How would you advise sales managers on what to look for in a great hire? (sighs) (laughs) um i i so i think you could substitute sales manager with any role in the organization and my like sort of process for interviewing is a couple of ways i think one you spend a lot of time with deep like no one reference checks deep enough they ask like a couple high level questions and then walk away you've really got to be deep and keep probing on these reference checks to understand where people um thrive i think the other thing too is most of the time when you're doing these reference checks people want to say positive things so you've really got to ask questions that tease out you know is this an a player versus is this a b would you ever sorry that would you ever do like a cold reference check because I, I find have, that the- I would never hire somebody without a cold reference check. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah. Like the world is small enough that you can always yeah. find somebody, uh, somebody to back channel. Um, the the second thing that I find super helpful is just being very forthcoming with the problems that you're struggling with today and asking that sales manager how they deal with it. So if I'm interviewing a CRO, it's okay. I did 5 million last year. I want to do 15 million this next year. How should I be thinking about this? And just see how their thought process moves. See what questions they ask with a sales manager. It might be, I've got three star performing reps. I've got two underperforming ones. How should I be thinking about turning around their performance or should I just be firing them? Again, see how they think, see what kind of questions they ask. Um, One of the deltas that I see in like great people versus good people is the ability to take their learnings from one place and tweak it to your Mm -hmm. circumstances. And so again, the good good sales manager will be like, I did this before and this worked. And so I'm going to do it again. The great person says, this piece worked, but given your business, I think you might make need to make this slight tweak. Mm. Perfect. Mike, do you have anything to add on this question? Finding great salespeople? I think my hack, I think, would be like, look for smart people. I'd rather hire a smart person who's never sold before, who I think could learn, than an experienced but not super motivated person. I think that, I think it's just, I'd rather have someone who's a sponge for knowledge and adaptable than someone who's inflexible. The reason I say that is every sales org is a little bit different, a little bit unique. There's like little nuances of of things that'll make you successful. And someone who's just hungry 
is driven to figure it out and will not be satisfied until the equation is right. But the person who's experienced, but like always looking for the next better job and always kind of disgruntled is going to be, yeah, this doesn't work the way that it's worked in the past for me. So I want to quit, you know? So it, it is a fine balance. I guess, what do you look for? You look for those traits like uh, innate curiosity, willingness to grind, drive, passion about something, they care, they, they want to win, I think. In, in sales, it kind of does boil down to, I want to figure out a way to win. I don't care what the obstacles are. I'm just going to figure it out. So yeah, try to screen for those things. And I think the back channel uh, reference is such a good point that people can interview really well, but it's really hard to fool the people mm. in your orbit as to whether or not you're good or not. So definitely do not neglect that step. It's arguably the most important in hiring. Uh, awesome. So we had a few more questions come in. So Cody is saying, ask to speak with one of their previous clients. Excellent. Um, it's, it's a great tip, Cody. Thank you for sharing with the audience. Um, and then we have a question from Michael that's uh, slightly different, but I'd love to, to have your take on it. Any advice that you're willing to share to someone who might want to get into technology sales, who has a proven track record in another industry where the tide may have changed? Amazing question, Michael. Thank you very much. I don't know who you are. Let's connect afterwards. It's a great question. Michael, um, I, I love your question, Michael, because I was in your shoes uh, seven or eight years ago. Um, I had worked in baseball, I had worked in consulting and I wanted to get into tech sales. And so I, I was like looking at a bunch of different org organizations and was lucky enough to join the Stripe sales team. And so, you know, I think one of the things that you can do is figure out what um, sort of transferable skills that you have, like you're trying to market yourself, you're trying to sell yourself. And so when you're reaching out to these sales managers or leaders who are hiring, I think you want to talk a little bit about how your unique and unconventional background could be really good for the organization. Um, like any sales rep would do, I think you also spend a bunch of time preparing. Like you figure out what makes that person tick. You learn about the organization. You learn about the competitors. And you show how much you know about that company. Um, I, I think showing up just like 120% prepared and, and better than everyone else and sort of aware of the things that you do well, aware of the things that you'll need to to learn in order to be successful in that role, someone will take a chance on you. Cause I'm, I'm in the same camp as Mike that like, you know, most frequently the people who do the best are the ones who just have really high slope. They're really smart. They have a desire to win and they're adaptable. It's not the person who's sold a similar product, you know, over and over and over again. And so I think you're just trying to look to at, at ways to show that like you're customer centric um, that you can be a consultative seller and that you're, you've got a growth mindset and you'll, you'll be able to continue to learn and grow and adapt as the organization continues to learn. Awesome. Uh, and then we have another question from the audience from Raghu. I can, I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing your name, Raghu. Uh, what is the criteria to hire a sales executive for a small design studio? Good to hire an experienced sales guy or girl uh, or to get coaching? Mike, maybe you could take that one. Could you repeat that question? Took some twists and turns. I just want yeah. to. Make... <laughs> uh, what's what is the criteria to hire a sales executive for a small design studio? Do okay. you need someone with experience, or can you get someone and uh, give them coaching? Someone with less experience. I think where my mind goes is. For a design studio specifically, you probably need someone who sold that type of product before. I think because design is its own type of product. It's not like SaaS, unless I'm missing the point of the question. It's like a, a design SaaS product. But you probably do need someone who speaks that language, who has worked in those design firms. I think that's an, that's an example of where domain expertise is more important uh, as an initial qualifier. And then you probably just want to like really examine what are the specifics of this role? It, like what exactly do I want this person to be doing day to day, week to week and month to month? And you're screening for, can this new person do those things? And are they a culture fit? Do they work hard? Are they going to grind? Do they have good relationships? All the other things that are typical, you still want to screen for, but just to put a bow on it, I, I think that design studio is like, that's its own, area that you need that experience. 
Awesome. Um, thank you, Mike, for answering that. So I actually have, a, it's a very popular, the team question. We could probably should do another event just on, <laughs> on, on managing teams. But last question, and then we'll move on to other uh, topics. This question uh, comes from Jonathan, um, uh, also before the event. And so he has asked us, once you hired, what are the best ways to onboard, develop, and retain the talent? So I think hiring, we kind of like spoke about quite a lot. Let's talk a bit about onboarding, developing and retaining. I led onboarding at Slack. I might be a good person to take an initial pass at this, but I think it is really important that you have an onboarding program in any sales org. Um, I published a piece on my Substack talking about self-guided onboarding. The reason for that, I'll explain what it is, I guess, before I explain the reason for it. It's basically like creating almost like a scavenger hunt for lack of a better uh, wording. It's like, here's, here's what I want you to have accomplished and here are the answers I want you to have found by the end of week one, week two. Here's the activity for week three. Here's the presentation for week four. Because um, in these orgs, things are always changing. If you put together all these materials around pricing, it's gonna be out of date in a quarter or two. Mm -hmm. If you put all these materials around your packaging or who leads what function, it, that all changes. So I think the best way to do it is to just admit, I need a process by which we put people in position to find answers and keep a pulse on whether or not these answers are up to date or not. And that's why I think the scavenger hunt kind of model makes a lot of sense, especially if you don't have the resources to do like very intentional onboarding. At Slack, we did like a full onboarding boot camp and flew everyone out to HQ and had like nine to five programs every single day while you were in town. That's great, but it's just not realistic for most orgs. So again, the, the other part of this beyond onboarding is training. Have a weekly training session that a sales manager leads where they're just getting the team together and talking about some important topic on a repeatable basis. Again, the skills will always change and evolve, but having the cadence and the heartbeat in place is what's important here. And someone on your management team, ideally everyone on your management team plays a role in teaching and reinforcing those concepts and practicing over time. Amazing. So I'm not going to let you off the hook quite yet. What about retaining? Oh, retaining. Yeah, your... yeah. Retaining people. Yeah. How do you make sure that once you've trained them, onboarded them, they're doing well, they don't leave? It's really hard. I mean, that's, that's one of those, I think the score takes care of itself. Why do people tend to leave orgs? They probably leave if they're managed by someone they don't like or think is a jerk or don't think respects them, or they don't think they can be successful long-term. You know, a lot of times it's the latter. It's just like, I can't sell this product. I don't like it. I don't get it. It's not working. The company's not working and I'm gone. At that point, you have much bigger problems in your company than are we retaining our sellers? So like if things are going great and the company's off to the races mm -hmm. and people are hitting and happy and the people are great and there's a good culture, people are going to stay in that org. So I don't know. It's, it's like, just do all the inputs as well as you can and the outputs take care of themselves. That's how I see that question. Nice. Thank you. Mecca, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I, I think it's, you know, for me, you're going gonna, gonna to sound like a broken record, but for me, it's all about customer centricity. And so um, a couple of the orgs that I was a part of, the first thing that you would do as a new AE is go sit in the support ticket queue to understand sort of what parts of the pro product were broken. Um, then you'd spend a bunch of time doing ride alongs. When I joined Stripe, I actually had to learn how to integrate the Stripe API and went to like a coding boot camp. And so this helped me be able to resonate more with, with developers. So whatever onboarding and, and, and you're, you're designing, I think you're just thinking about how do I put my, reps in the shoes that my customers are going to be in so that they can talk, you know, one-to-one -one and have those conversation really resonate. Uh, on your second part, in terms of retaining, I think a lot of that is like, one, you're putting your reps in a position to be successful um, in the short term. And then two, you're putting them in position to be successful in the long term. And that usually comes down to career growth, whether it's moving up market from SMB to enterprise or whether it's moving from an IC role to a manager role. Um, I always try to promote from within when you can and then but also recognize there are times when you need to get skill sets from somebody from the outside. And so, you know, I was always very honest about my hope to always fill new spots in my org with people who are overperforming. And oftentimes that wasn't just on the number. It was on doing all the little things that it takes to 
um, have a, a company and a sales org grow. And so I always thought about trying to challenge my reps as well. I'd have all these different projects that, you know, who's going to help us manage the product op- product feedback and product operations um, process that we do quarterly? Who's going to be responsible for being a spin-up buddy for, for all the new reps? Um, just having these things that are sort of outside the core hit the number, um, I think also allow people to stretch and grow outside of just the, the sales skills. Yeah, Justin just uh, wrote something very interesting in the chat. 82% of managers think they are coaching their reps, but only 14% of reps believe they are being coached. Some very, very shocking stats there. Um, and Steve, thank you very much for the comment. Uh, we love that you're enjoying this. So with that, let's wrap the team questions um, and let's move to the next point, which is customers. Um, and let's talk about recession-proof processes during a downturn. So a lot of customers are cutting budgets, cutting tools. How can you ensure success? Like what are the best practices to make sure your tool doesn't get canceled? (laughs) Yeah, uh, you know, two things. The customer success side of me would say that like cancellation doesn't start at cancellation. The renewal process started at onboarding. It started a year ago. And so you've got to make sure that um, your success team or whoever's responsible for keeping customers happy are thinking about it from the second they get onboarded. Um, How are you reminding customers about the value that you're providing? How are you looking at their their activity in your product to make sure that that everything is, um, you know, you're not seeing any any drop off? Um, The other thing that I'll say is that, like, this is a moment in time. Um, we're all, I think many of us are thinking about building generational businesses or being at an, a sales org that's going to be successful for the, for the multi-year time frame. And so I'm always thinking about being long-term greedy. So when COVID first hit, I think it made sense to pause certain, like there were certain industries that just got well up worse than others. So like for our travel clients, I think we were willing to pause their contract or give them a temporary downgrade and say, hey, if things come back to normal, we'll move you back to that normal price. And so it can be easy to be short-sighted and say, hey, no, no breaks here. And I think oftentimes that just leads to churn. So I really think about being empathetic with our customers, figuring out sort of like, when like you're also going to have people who are going to come and use sort of like the recession or the pandemic as an excuse and like they're still using the product fully so i think you need to think take things by a case by case scenario versus just having a broad rule of like we're cutting everything 20 percent um and again always think about the long-term relationship that you have with the customer versus just the short-term arr hit that you might take Mm Mike, what 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 do you think about that? Um, would you offer discounts? Would you give payment terms? What's your view on keeping customers on board? I think it is. I mean, it's all first principles approach. Like if you do sell the type of products around travel and the recession is happening around this COVID event that makes travel impossible, it's a different answer than if you, you know, sell online ads on Facebook and people are using Facebook now more than ever. So I do think it's like, it's a form of rediscovery. You know, you do discovery Mm -hmm. initially and when people's needs change, the first thing you should do is, okay, let me learn, 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 learn. And then we can figure out a course of action. But I I just think that that'd be my answer is just do do new discovery based on the new information and and take it from there. Mm. And uh, we have a comment from Paul. In my experience, going wide and deep within an org to ensure that everyone is aware of the solution and is gaining value from using it, at least benefiting from any outputs generated. Great, great comment, Paul. So I have a follow-up question to, to Paul's comment. So let's say you are a, a sales leader who has both net new and renewals and upsells uh, in his or her remit. How would you reallocate your resources? Would you put more people on renewals uh, in time of down market? Would you put people on more net new? What's your thinking there? I think that I I wouldn't go to people immediately. I like drill down on processes because usually Mm. if you're going to fail around renewal, it's because you don't have good enough processes in place to actually have a, a real read on how happy are they and how have their plans change and are they going to renew or not? I think of the CS function, like it's, it, again, it's more discovery is needed. How are things going? Mm. How have you been using the product? Here's your usage. Like the, the worst version of uh, customer success is just like, 
hey, I don't want to, I don't want to do anything because me interacting with them is only going to spur problems and I don't need more problems, you know, then, then problems are brewing that you don't know about and they surprise mm -hmm. you. So again, before moving ahead count, I would, if I were a leader of that team, I'd go, Hey, how can we cover our customer base hundred percent and know first every big customer is happy. Then every medium customer is happy and won't churn. Then every small customer is happy and won't churn. And you just try to like rebuild up your customer base segment by segment. Mm, it's a really interesting point there about rediscovery. I think a lot of us forget about that when we're, when we're yeah. checking in with our customers. And then if, if there are gaps there and you go, uh oh, we don't have the resources to connect with everyone and do this discovery, the volume of discovery that needs to be done, then you can think about maybe we, re we need to reallocate someone. And the follow-up point I'll make is that um, churn is much more damaging to the business than not hitting a net new goal for a given quarter. So like just thin slicing, if you need to reallocate some heads from net new to make sure that your customers renew, like probably a good idea to consider doing that in, in sticky mm. situations. And so I, I want to put Mecca on the spot then. And so let's say you are reallocating resources and you need to train your hunters, right? The AEs to do more of that rediscovery process and more of that kind of reconfirmation. How would you go about that? Well, the, they may be better at it than existing CSMs in a lot of cases, like not to, not to shots fired across from function to function, <laughs> but that is the, I think that's where AEs are good is they go in and like need to do discovery to sell deals. So I think they'll be well equipped to do discovery to renew a deal. Um, and I do think that like there are skills that CSMs, the stereotypical CSM has that AEs should learn and, and would be well served to learn. I think CSMs typically know much more about the product than AEs. If you're painting in broad strokes, AEs would, would if, if AEs could go in and do all the deployment work themselves, they'd be a much better seller. And if CSMs could go in and do the discovery work that an AE does before they deploy, they'd be a much better, uh, they'd be much better at their job. Mecca, what's your view on that? I mean, I think Mike hit it right on the edge, head. Mm. Um, a lot of this comes down to customer centricity and product knowledge. And so if I'm thinking about AEs stepping into a CSM role, ideally they have the toolkit already to do it because, you know, it's what we train them on on, on, the, on the door. And obviously there's like probably a little bit level of detail that CSMs can go deeper than your average um, AE or hunter. But I think in the org organizations I've been mm -hmm. a part of, like there was actually some fluidity um, between both. And also in a lot of high growth organizations, your first CSMs are your AEs. I remember having <laughs> customers and keep them happy and deal with the first renewal. And so I don't think the skill sets are, are that diverse. Mm. Nice. Um, so cautious, we have 15 minutes left and we have one very big and important topic to address. And that is the relationship between the sales leader and the CEO and the investor board. Um, I think right now the Q4 board meeting season is kicking off at companies a lot of sales leaders will be probably for the first time in their life called up to present in those meetings. Um, what's your advice? Like what I'm, I'm a head of sales first time, you know, my CEO called me into a meeting. How do I prepare? How do I leave a good impression? Yeah. I mean, I think number one, you've got a good bottoms up and tops down view of what the forecast is and it's bulletproof. You've gone to every single rep with their big deals and you've really poked to make sure that there's substance behind there. I think you understand what your net new, what your in quarter number is every quarter to give a pretty tight range. I think it's always better to under promise and over deliver, but we've all worked with people who've sort of quite sandbagged and they're significantly off. Like, I don't think it's a great thing to exceed your number by 140% in quarter. Like you should have been predicting that um, pretty early on. And so for me, it is all about just making sure that what I'm saying actually happens. Um, and I think you do that by making sure that you've looked at sort of the key um, opportunities that are going to move the needle. And in any business where there's scale and lots of opportunities, you know, there's going to be the one-off one that you think is supposed to close and then it ends up getting pushed. But you should also offset that with something else that got pulled forward somehow. And so 
Um, I want to make sure that whatever it is that I tell my CEO and I tell the board ends up happening, you know, three months later. Um, and ideally, you've built this practice over time where you've sort of, you know, you've you call the number at the beginning of the quarter, you see where you end up and you go back and you do an audit and you say, you know, whether or not we overperformed or underperformed, what did we miss such that like our forecast is a little bit off? And ideally, every single quarter, things are getting, you know, slightly more tuned. And as you grow, you're getting more and more predictable every quarter. Mike, what about you? What would you like to see from a sales leader uh, in a craft board meeting? I think that the playbook kind of depends based on how the quarter and how the year went. If you crushed it, that's one thing. If you hit, but barely, that's another. If you missed barely, that's another. And if you whiffed completely, the tone, I think, changes a little bit. But the things that are consistent are, you know, start with the big take, like just speak in a way that's easy to understand. Like, here's the big picture and then keep filling it in with like, you know, the, the next level down of detail, next level down of detail, next level down of detail. And I think an investor should walk out of your presentation knowing a few things clearly. And this may sound really obvious, but this isn't part of every like sales uh, part of a board meeting. Did you hit or not? How, by how much? What percentage attainment? Like you would be shocked at how sometimes that information is buried or not super clear. And you feel kind of dumb as an investor being like, oh, I'm so, like, I, hey, sorry, I can't tell. Did we hit or not? So just make the, the information really obvious, really easy to understand. And then just like, why did that happen? If we hit 102%, give some commentary. How, how did we make that number? Do we expect to do it again? What are the risks? What almost derailed us? What's going to derail us? I just think it's like a clear eyed view on here's what happened. Here's what we did well. Here's what we didn't do well. Here's what's going to you know, allow us to hit next time. And here's the focus areas and risk areas. I think if you are uh, doing too much politics and like too much, like everything's great, that doesn't uh, gain you a lot of trust. If you're too negative, I, I guess I'd rather have someone who's a little bit too negative and cautiously optimistic than someone who's overly positive. But, and, and then there's the piece of like, you may have a follow-up question and just be super well-versed whatever an investor is gonna ask you I just went through, I just talked to those sellers. I know those deals. I know these numbers. I know the conversion rates. Just be ready for random questions that if you really know your stuff, you're prepared to answer. I, I think Mike brings up such such good points on this one of the like, if everything is good, there's probably something that you're not talking about. And so in every quarter, no matter how great it is, I think there's some highlights and lowlights. The other thing about a board meeting is like, usually there are, you're looking at what happened in the past. Um, but what's also important is to make sure like, if you're a sales leader and you don't have a two quarter forward forecast, then you're also failing before you've even started. You should understand sort of, you know, in the quarters where I hit, what did my pipeline look two quarters beforehand? And so, you know, I always want somebody who's thinking thinking ahead. And when I think about having sat in that CRO seat and, and going to a board meeting, there's so much prep that like, obviously you should have the one slide that sort of quickly explains whether, you know, whatever's important in your business, whether it's like, what was the net new? What was the expansion? What's pipeline coverage ratio? What's quota attainment? Um, like there's a, a few things that I think kind of differ per business that should give you a, a pretty good dashboard of, of what's happening. But again, I think you can tell the difference between a good sales leader and a great sales leader. And when you dive one layer deeper, how much understanding do they have of the different levers of the business and what drove out performance? Like, can they talk about it by segment? Can they talk about it by channel? Can they talk about it by rep? Like, do they know what their hiring plan looks like going forward? And so you just like, you know, board meetings could always feel like a pain. And I would think about the number of hours I would spend preparing for them and then not get very many questions um, or get one question that like, I was really happy that I was prepared for, but I think it's a great, hygiene, even if you don't have these board meetings, I would almost have mock ones where at the end of the quarter, I'm summarizing everything, thinking about my learnings, looking forward and just starting to build that repetition and that process that I think it takes to, to sort of lead a revenue function at scale. And what's the level of detail that you guys would expect from a sales leader? Because I think it's very hard to be on the one hand, I mean, we've learned from like, did you hit or not? First slide, red, green, orange, <laughs> you know, and and then on the other, I think 
the other extreme of that is to overload the board members with details, right? Do they need to know about every deal? How do you know how to strike the right balance? I, I think you summarize high level. And then you have all of the backup, either in the appendix or in the voiceover, if you need it. But like, I don't think any detail is too small. Like if someone asks you who you lost most deals to, you should know that. You should know what your loss reasons are. You should know what your attrition look like. You should know what your hiring plan is looking like going forward. Again, all these things don't need to be slides. Like I think the other thing that I love doing too is having the same set of slides repeated over and over and over. So every quarter your board knows what to expect. They know what they're going to see. Sometimes you make a slight tweak as the business evolves and changes, or as you've got like slightly more predictability into something, you want to add that thing, but there shouldn't be like so much wholesale change each quarter. The board should know what the slide is going to look like. And it kind of looks the same every single quarter and they can see, see changes there. And then those little changes is going to be where people dig in. So like, Again, if your quota attainment dropped off the face of the earth, you should know that you're probably going to get some questions there. If our close rates went down, I would be digging into all of my loss reasons and who the competitors were and whether the source of channels were different. That might help explain it. Like usually you're just you build a predictable system that works and then you spend time in the board meeting talking about the things that have changed since the prior quarter. Amazing. And how do you I think in those conversations, especially when things are not going well, um it's easy for the dialogue not to be constructive <laughs> um can you talk about the right like what does the right relationship look like between the ceo the head of sales and board members i would say a lot of times um especially in like high growth startups vps of sales can become the scapegoat when it's like actually there's deeper issues that sales is downstream of those a lot of times product issues like if the product was perfect and was flying off the shelves you know usually sales is going to have a good quarter if there's issues with the product or issues with your icp or competitive issues vp of sales it's very hard for them to just sell around those things so i think that's the first like healthy level setting is like the CEO and the product org and VP of sales and sales leadership move in lockstep together. And it's a mistake usually to make the VP of sales a scapegoat for the miss, you know? And I also think that a lot of being a successful sales leader is does your team believe in you and fight for you or not? If the answer is yes, you're probably doing a lot of things that are hard to quantify that you know, you, you probably care and you probably know about the product and you probably invest in people. And if you, if the answer is no, you probably blame and you probably don't invest in training. And like, so I, I just think that a lot of it is seeking to understand, is this person a good leader for the people that work in their function? And that's a different thing than did they hit or did they miss? There's like a lot of different aspects I think that are important to be aware of as a, as someone evaluating company performance in that way. I see. Mecca, any learnings from you from, you know, when that relationship works well, uh, what happens there? Yeah. I mean, I think if you're, a, if you're a revenue leader and you're looking for the board to solve your problems, you're probably going to be in a hurt locker. Like, I, I think that that is not the function of the board. Um, and ideally, like you've had many of these conversations with your CEO in, in advance of, of these meetings. And so I think it's more just a sense check. I think it is a, you come in, you didn't hit, and this is my plan going forward. Do these levers seem to make sense? Uh, and, and I think for the most time, like there should be just like a lot of nodding. Um, I don't mm -hmm. think the like discussion questions and the troubleshooting, like it's just not really what's going to happen successfully. Like there are, there are board members who do dig in at first round. We spent a bunch of times with our, with our founders, but again, that sort of session is a one-on-one -on -one session with the VP of sales. It's not a, you know, sitting in the board board meeting and troubleshooting live. And I think the other thing too, is knowing as a sales leader, you should understand where, who I should be getting feedback from and where they can actually be helpful. So there may be some targeted questions where, where folks can be helpful, mm -hmm. but Again, I wouldn't be looking to my board as helping me solve uh, some of the inherent issues that I'm having in my sales organization. And in other words, don't make the board the scapegoat. <laughs> don't make the salesperson the scapegoat. Don't make the board the scapegoat. Yeah. Um, 
So I we have five minutes left. So I just have a closing questions to both of you. And if anyone in the audience has any questions, now now is your time. So my closing question is: What do all effective go-to-market teams have in common? Usually, a great product. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I was going to try to think of something way more clever, but Mike's right. The, the secret to winning work on work on really good product teams. You never want to be working for the laggard. <laughs> if you have a, it's like something needs to be in place, and then you go to the next thing. If you have a great product in place, and it's like big, big target market and uh, big TAM, and not a lot of competition. Okay, now it's just can you block and tackle and field your position. Can you hire quickly enough? Can you train them quickly enough? Can you build a culture and a spirit well enough? Can you avoid fumbling critical things like sales compensation and just like things that need to be in place? And then it's just constant de-risking and like, what's going to derail us? Let's go problem solve. What's going to derail us? Go problem solve. Um, and it's just really hard. Like the, being in a hyper growth startup that just continues on that trajectory and never misses, like you need a few miracles. You need right place, right time, right product, right market, right buyer, right competitive set. There's just an element of luck and the, the amazing outcomes I think are where like those conditions for success meet relentless execution and focus. And then the third thing is hire great people. You know, that's, that's part of, uh, the point earlier about like back channel and make sure that you don't hire people who are going to cost you cycles. It, it is devastating to hire the wrong person. So ho hopefully some, there's some lessons there. It's all about people and being in the right place at the right time and catching a few lucky waves every once in a while. Awesome. Mecca, do you have anything to add? No, choose the right product, hire the right people, put everyone in a position to be successful and don't let things come as a surprise. Um, be very transparent, open and honest with um, folks inside of your organization. Um, and then hire people who are like customer centric product focus and have a growth mindset. Things change and evolve so quickly. Mm. The skill sets that you need change and evolve pretty quickly. So you got to make sure you find uh, flo folks who are super flexible. Awesome. Um, with that, thank you guys so much for your time. Um, I think we had a great discussion address a lot of interesting points. I'm sure we'll, some of it will find its way on LinkedIn, onto our own blog in, in one way or another. Uh, and so my last question is, where can people follow you? I know, Mike, you spoke about your newsletter. If someone wants to learn more about you and more of your wisdom, where should they go? Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm Mecca at first round is my email. And then on Twitter, I'm Big Mecca Style. I'm at Mike Marg underscore on Twitter. I don't know who beat me to that handle, but maybe they'll be freed uh, over the coming months. And uh, yeah, I've got a Substack, early GTM on Substack. And uh, shout out to Heller and Libster. We do a podcast together called The Bottom Up Pod. So I'm sure those are all on Google somewhere. <laughs> Amazing. Um, we will send, share those as well with our audience in our post uh, post event email. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the questions. Um, if you are curious about up leveling your sales game, make sure to follow sales room uh, on LinkedIn. We do events like this every two weeks, we post a lot of interesting content. And if you're curious about evolving your customer communication to the next level and making sure your salespeople can make the most out of every opportunity, make sure to sign up on salesroom.com for a free account. Thank you very much. And I'll hope to meet you guys again on other sales room events. Good evening, Dave. <laughs> See you. Yeah. Bye. Yeah. Bye.